Uh, well, there's, um, there's certainly been a lot of, of news this week, um, much of it, of course, about the, the start of uh, Donald Trump's trial in the Senate. Uh, but some important things have been happening uh, in Russia as well, uh, particularly the announcement Wednesday by, by Vladimir Putin shifting greater authority uh, to Parliament, uh, which has left many uh, wondering uh, what this means about Putin's own plans to to relinquish the presidency uh, or not um, in a few years. So we're especially especially fortunate to have with us this evening an expert on on Putin's Russia, uh, Joshua Yaffa, uh, who is the Moscow correspondent for the New Yorker. Uh, he's been covering Russia for for much of the of the past decade, uh, and his new book Between Two Fires uh, offers a, a truly fascinating and and revealing look at the impact that the Putin era has had on, above all, uh, the nation's psyche uh, and the moral struggles and calculations that many uh, Russians confront. Uh, Josh has written a very, uh, a very nuanced portrait of Russia, nothing like the simplistic view of that country as, as a, uh, an oppressed people uh, lorded over by a KGB-trained dictator. Uh, Josh describes a people who fall somewhere in the middle between, between an oppressor and an oppressed, prone to compromise and accommodation with the state, but still nimble and resourceful enough to try to turn the system to, to some advantage uh, with mixed results. Uh, in his book, he highlights the stories uh, of a number of individual Russians who've struggled to balance the strict and often arbitrary, arbitrary demands of a modern authoritarian regime with their own personal desires and consciences. Uh, um, uh, among the people he writes about are the, the director of the country's main television channel, an Orthodox priest, uh, a Chechen human rights activist, and a Crimean zookeeper, uh, plus, plus several others. Uh, and Josh is telling these cases exemplify the persistence of a, of a Russian archetype, the, the wily man, as a leading sociologist once put it, someone prone to adapt to a repressive system by going along with it while also trying to circumvent its rules. Uh, Josh's interest in Russia goes back two decades. Uh, he started learning Russian in college and first visited as a student in the summer of 2001. After getting a master's degree in journalism and international affairs, he worked a bit as an associate editor at Foreign Affairs, then moved to Moscow eight years ago. He reported from there first for The Economist uh, and several other public publications before uh, landing at The New Yorker in 2015. Josh will be in, in conversation uh, here this evening with uh, Julia Yaffe, a Russian-born American journalist who herself spent time covering Russia for The New Yorker, uh, as well as foreign policy, uh, between 2009 and 2012. Uh, in the years since, uh, Julia has written for The New Republic, Politico, and The Atlantic, and currently covers national security and foreign policy for GQ magazine. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming both uh, Josh and Julia. everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you everybody for coming out tonight to see the wonderful Josh Yaffa. Um, Josh and I go back quite, uh, quite a number of years, especially the time when Josh showed up in Moscow to get his accreditation at the Foreign Ministry from Foreign Affairs magazine when I was accredited from Foreign Policy magazine and they said, Josh Yaffa for foreign, aren't you a girl? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Josh, this is a really, congratulations Thank on you. what is a really terrific and really important book. And as we were talking backstage, I was saying to you, I'm so glad you've written this uh, because we've read so many books about Putin. We've also read so many books about and articles about the dissidents, the opposition, and we don't, and that's like maybe 10% of the population. We don't hear a lot about the people who are in between, who make do, who get by. And as a Russia watcher, I'm so glad you've written this because it's such a rich topic, but I wanted to ask you about why you decided to write about this um, and where the idea came from. Sure, Th th thanks for the generous introduction and thanks to you all for, for being here tonight. The idea came to me 
slowly as I found I wasn't exactly able to capture what I was seeing and feeling about Russia, and maybe because I wasn't understanding the full picture at first myself, and I arrived to Russia with that dichotomy that you mentioned of, of looking for the oppressors and looking for uh, the oppressed and, and either wanting to label everyone a mini Stalin or a neo Sakharov. And, and that makes for good journalism to a point uh, or easy journalism, uh, which um, from my perspective starting out was, was the same thing as, as good. Um, <laughs> but uh, with time I realized that I wasn't doing justice to the country, to the people, to the place as I was actually beginning to understand it, and there was a lot left out of the Russia story, or in fact, the majority of the real Russia story was left out of that picture. But I didn't totally have a conceptual framework for understanding what Russia was then if it wasn't this battle, uh, perpetual, eternal, unavoidable battle between uh, Putin and the opposition, say, or whatever form that takes throughout Russian history. Um, And so... The Prism of the Wily Man, which we can talk about a bit, which which takes up most of the prologue uh, of the book, was a way for making sense of what was going on in Russian society and helping me understand the way that most people, like people everywhere, in fact, right? This was not unique to Russia, and that was the other, uh, I don't want to say insight, because it's actually so obvious and banal to a certain degree, but but um, maybe underappreciated by me was how much the dynamics that guide people's lives in Russia are ultimately so familiar and so universal with people who are simply trying to get by, to make do, who have some quite uh, quite noble uh, or at least understandable ambition for their lives and what they want to accomplish and set about doing so in whatever reality they happen to be in. They can't change that larger macro reality, but they can try and through compromise and this idea of wiliness get accomplished uh, what they can. And in so doing, oftentimes they change through the process of those compromises and in aggregate society certainly changes over time. And it's also, I think we were all drawn to this story of oppressor and oppressed because it's a it's an easy story, but it's a sexier story. There's innate conflict. It's also the prism that we see it, from which we see it here in the West, right? Of uh, in many countries, right? There's the dictator, there's Saddam Hussein, and there's Chalabi, and there's uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and all the people who are against him, who, because they're against Gaddafi, they must be good and virtuous, right? And then somebody like Aung San Suu Kyi happens, and we don't know where to put her. <laughs> did, they, did this give you any insight into why things like that happen? Uh, no, but it, it made me realize um, the more interesting for me field of journalistic inquiry was exactly that gray zone that's oftentimes left unexplored, but that just became an interesting psychological, I guess, problem uh, for me to understand how it is that individuals navigated those circumstances. And the characters in the book, I purposely chose people who I, at least, couldn't come to some final conclusion about were they good or they bad? They, they were people who defied my attempts at categorization. I, I would welcome other people's choices in that regard. I wouldn't sort of argue that they're objectively uncategorizable, um, but they were by me, and that's what interested me in them, and that's uh, how they ended up in the book. I was searching for the kinds of characters where even after spending how many hours with them over months, in some cases you know, years, I still couldn't put them in the box of, were they doing something noble or venal? Were they to be uh, commended or criticized? I wasn't sure myself. And it was important to me that that's where I landed with each of the characters, or rather the experience of the characters itself didn't allow me uh, to reach some kind of conclusive uh, moral position. So before we get deeper into this, do you want to outline what the Wiley I think you were going to read something sure. about what the Wiley Man is, or who sure. he is, or she is. I'll read a, a little bit, just a page and a half or so from the uh, prologue. At the start of 2012, I moved back to Moscow to work as a journalist, covering Russia for foreign audiences at The Economist and with time for The New Yorker. In the Western imagination, Russia is a nation held captive by a dictator interested only in his own power and profit. As the story goes, 
Putin lords over a population of 145 million people, trapping them in a cage welded shut by propaganda and repression. Yet over the course of several years, as I reported on a period of major historical turmoil and change for Russia, street protests the winter I arrived, extravagant preparations for the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, the annexation of Crimea, a standoff with the West over the war in Ukraine, fallout from allegations of meddling and collusion in the 2016 U.S. presidential election, and the combined toll of sanctions and economic crisis, I met ordinary Russians who showed no sign of somehow being held against their will. These were not necessarily enthusiastic Putin supporters or even people who voted for him. Instead, they treated the Putin state as a given, neither good nor bad, but simply there, like an element in the Earth's atmosphere, and then went about constructing their lives around it. Governments, of course, exist in America and Europe, as do all manner of external structures and constraints that people, myself included, must constantly navigate. The pressure of conformism is universal and ever-present, a feature of existing in the world no matter where you find yourself. But the presence of the state and the aura of inevitability of its demands struck me as particularly acute in Russia. One could not live in ignorance or indifference to the urges and caprices of the state. In fact, it was to your advantage to guess what it wanted from you and to deliver that while also being clever enough to extract some benefit for yourself. This, roughly speaking, is the predicament of Levada's wily man. Yuri Levada being the sociologist who came up uh, with the concept in an essay in 2000, for whom the state contains both the threat of great hardship and the promise of incomparable opportunity. I came to understand that in Russia, the two forces, state and citizen, speak in dialogue, a conversational timber often missed by the foreign ear. Lev Gudkov, Levada's one-time student who became a respected sociologist and pollster in his own right, wrote that for many Russians, quote, the state is not simply a technical apparatus of large-scale administration, but a symbolic institution embodying and reproducing the basic understandings of human nature. The state takes on almost pantheistic importance. Though made by man in his image, it is an, also an omnipresent force whose power exceeds that of its creator. In Moscow, in my travels around the country, I met fiercely proud and brilliant men and women, activists, economists, journalists, business owners, who believed the best, if not the only, way to realize their vision was in concord with the state. It was hard to believe they were wrong, nor was I confident I would choose any differently. There was my friend with a graduate degree from Oxford who came back to Moscow to take a job in a state-run think tank, a place where smart young professionals thought up good ideas, half of which were implemented, and the other half of which, those with more worrying political implications, were discarded. I would periodically have lunch with a youth activist who had been unable to resist the offer to take a seat in Parliament, where he was quickly told to vote along party lines as the Kremlin dictated or risk losing the funding for his youth programs. For a while, the most fashionable job in Moscow was working on state-funded urban beautification projects, expanding pedestrian zones, renovating city parks, launching bike-sharing programs, rethinking public transport routes. Such initiatives made the city undeniably more pleasant and humane. With time, similar efforts expanded to other cities around the country. Even in the absence of larger democratic reforms, if anything, Russia's politics tacked in an opposite, unmistakably regressive direction, its cities became more desirable, attractive, and enjoyable places to live. A debate emerged among my friends in Moscow. Is it laudable to lend one's talents and expertise to the state so as to achieve real change on a local level, or does this only help perpetuate an unjust and inefficient system? The question was never really settled, but surfaced time and again, a referendum on the permissibility of compromise that repeated at regular intervals. Does harnessing the resources and power of institutions you ultimately consider malevolent to achieve something good mean the joke is on them or you? Although the gulag is a mostly unhelpful metaphor for understanding Putin's Russia, I found myself returning to one thing Ivan Denisovich learned in the camps. If you're stuck inside an unjust system, isn't cheating it a bit here and there for your own purposes an entirely rational, even virtuous response? Maybe there are no good answers to these questions. An impossibility captured in a Russian saying, between two fires, the condition of being stuck in the middle of two opposing forces bigger than yourself.
Making it out the other side is just about the best outcome available. The more I thought and wrote about the ways people actually live and work in Putin's Russia, the more I realized it was largely impossible to separate them into two camps, the oppressed and the oppressors. Yes, there were obvious victims and those whose resolute, unyielding positions brought them great frustration and hardship, just as there were the unambiguously corrupt and sadistic who used the state's authority merely to lie in their pockets or who got off on enacting all manner of petty cruelties. But most of the people I encountered were neither. They were strivers, nimble and resourceful, who usually set out with virtuous and thoroughly understandable motives. What fascinated me were the compromises and prevarications required in bringing those initial motives to life and how, over time, those concessions can change a, change a person and the very rationale that motivated one's actions in the first place. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thanks. Um, so I, I see some people kind of shaking their heads about already about some of the kind of compromises you described. And I just want to start by saying or asking you about what you said earlier, where this is not a phenomenon unique to Russia. And we've, in fact, we've seen this a lot under the Trump administration that uh, people who were very much against it. A lot of people who were never Trumpers who kind of slowly, well, you know, if I, you know, I could help the country, blah, blah, blah. Um, how do you see the, like, did you come down on any side of, you know, where are there red lines for any of these people? Are there, I want to interrogate this concept a little bit more. Like, what's the line between um, somebody who is co-opted and a collaborator? Um, do we need people like Sakharov and Navalny? Um, sure, yeah, yeah, you, you, question, you, you but, definitely yeah. need them, and, and I applaud them, and they have my admiration. Um, my, I have no beef with them, the opposite. I, I hold them in great esteem. I just don't think they're necessarily the most uh, effective or illustrative journalistic prisms for making sense of Russia. Um, Not as representative. Right. Um, as far as where the red lines lie, I mean, that, that in, in this book, I, I purposely didn't uh, draw them. Uh, that's different than what I might say about my own life and my own political and social uh, context. I think there are a lot of interesting parallels between the kinds of compromises I describe in the book and the reason that people go for them in the first place, what they're hoping to achieve and what they think they can achieve and where they're actually right, where a compromise does actually yield at least some version of the thing they were searching for and where it goes totally awry or they themselves are emerged so um, squeezed and, and jaded from the process that they're not the same person that they were when they went in. The big difference uh, that I see, and maybe you see more and the audience can name some also, is the singular role that the state plays in Russia that thankfully doesn't exist here. There's actually a really welcome uh, degree of diversity in American social economic life outside of the state. And in Russia, that's really not the case, and that makes this question of compromise more inevitable than I think it is here. I think that here I can understand it, but it's not as if there really wasn't any other choice for person X or Y realizing their, their motives or their kind of professional ambitions or whatever. One fact that really struck me, and it's um, so simple and, and, and kind of obvious, until, but yet it wasn't until it was pointed out to me, was what I learned when I was reporting the chapter about the theater director, Kirill Serebnikov, who was uh, and is a very celebrated avant-garde experimental theater director who for a time when the Putin state had a short-lived interest in supporting avant-garde art forms, he really benefited from state largesse and used state money to put on some really remarkable productions, interestingly, many of which were implicitly or even explicitly critical of the very state that was paying for them. Um, but as one of his friends said to me about why Serebnikov would have done this, why he would have put his hand out and taken state money from a government that he found objectionable uh, at, at, at least. And the person said, you know, in Russia, you don't have the choice of making a movie with state funding or without state funding. That would be an easy choice, okay? Make the movie without state funding and your conscience is clean. But that's not really the offer on the table. The offer on the table is do you want to make a movie or not. And if you want to make a movie, well, there's really only one way to do that currently uh, in Russia. And when you put the question that way, it becomes a lot harder uh, 
and certainly impossible for me to sit and judge Serebnikov taking money from the Kremlin to make these movies. I mean, he's a film director who was born, uh, or theater stage and film director, born in a certain time and place. He only has one shot at, at the prime productive years of his career. Why shouldn't he make the kinds of films that he wants to make? And um, and this is, I guess, more of a comment than a question, but I've been surprised personally to come back uh, from Russia to the States where Russian dissidents and journalists are lauded as heroes and martyrs because they stand up to the state because they refuse to make the kinds of compromises you describe in your book. And yet, as soon as things get a little bit difficult here, you see so many people making like running to make compromises that are so much... Uh, the bar is so much lower. The stakes are so much lower. It isn't like, do I go to jail? Do I not go to jail? Do I get killed? Do I not get killed? Do I make a movie? Do I not make a movie? It's like, can I pay my mortgage and have a really nice lifestyle or not pay my mortgage and have a slightly less lesser lifestyle? And they're more than willing to make that compromise. So I guess to turn that into a question mm -hmm. is, you know, you, you live in both worlds. You straddle both worlds, the U.S. and Russia. Do you understand why we fetishize, you know, those two extremes in a place like Russia? We're obsessed with Putin. All we want to know is what he's thinking, what he, you know, um, what he wants, what he, what he said, what it means, and then, you know, the hero martyrs. Why we're not interested in the? Well, I hope people are more interested and they <laughs> buy your book because you've made it so interesting. But. Do you have an insight now into why we uh, fetishize those two extremes? Well, I think it's not just in Russia. That's just our kind of narrative proclivities or analytical proclivities anywhere, right? That it's um, the, the going back to Greek literature, just the idea of the hero and the antihero in, in cleanly defined roles is just more digestible and understandable. And so I'm not sure how particular it is to Russia, though Putin makes it so easy. He's such a perfect comic book supervillain that it's hard to resist the urge to make every story about him because stories framed around him, they're just so good. They're so juicy. They sell well. They're fun to write. I mean, he just makes it too easy. Um, I, I'm beginning to suspect by design. Uh, he's very happy with that uh, arrangement and his kind of positioning in um, global geopolitics through that um, prism, but but there I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure how particular it is um, to Russia. Um, despite yeah, Putin occupying I think a particular place in our collective geopolitical imagination. So, do you think that because so much of it, uh, so much of contemporary Russia revolves around Putin and the state that he embodies, and there isn't an obvious ideology like there was in the Soviet uh, Union. You know, you mentioned Ernst being a государственник, uh, which you, I would be great if you explained. Do you think that um, that, that государственник being a stand-in for a state ideology, do you think it makes it easier for people to compromise? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, you weigh in Maybe as to, to what, what we, if we agree on the definition of государственник, but I mean, essentially means a, a, a statist for all intents and purposes, but it's someone who places the state in a, kind of elevated uh, position who, who cedes certain interests and privileges to the state above those of the individual and thinks that the state interests are take uh, primacy over the interest of, of the individual. And that seems to be very much how Putin sees the world. The collapse of the Soviet Union was a great catastrophe, not because he was a committed Marxist, but because this center of state power uh, grew feeble and weak and collapsed from within. And, and that is the great tragedy uh, of the Soviet collapse as far as Putin understands it. And someone like Konstantin Ernst, the head of Channel One, who I write about in one of the chapters, who is an interesting guy because he has this background as a perestroika era quasi hippie auteur who was making shows uh, about German art house films while wearing a black leather motorcycle jacket and with long hair grew into being the premier and most powerful propagandist of the Putin era. Uh, but for him, well, that's a fascinating transformation for me and one he takes no small amount of pride in. He still likes to position himself as this kind of counterculture rebel, even though he um, wields power over the country's uh, television channel with the largest reach. There is uh, some degree of continuity or maybe less contradiction or even compromise in his case because he's someone who, despite his taste in art house film and choosing to put 
the offbeat, quirky American television series Fargo on primetime and channel one, he uh, never stopped believing in the central or kind of premier authority of the state that for him, that's not a contradiction. And that's what makes him interesting to me. Something that a friend of his told me uh, for the, my profile, the chapter of him that's uh, about him that's in the book. He said, Ernst is an intellectual and an esthet, but he's no liberal. And I have to sit with that thought for a minute because actually in my life, those three terms are often interchangeable or, or kind of collapsible into one entity. But they haven't been historically in, right. in European or American culture, right? And uh, since you've mentioned Ernst, and I, I, I'm sure a lot of you read the excerpt, the profile of Constantine Ernst, the director of Channel One in The New Yorker, I think a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he was a really interesting choice because, and this is a bit of a criticism, like I didn't see what compromise he was making. Like he loved films. He gets to make, like having an aesthetic isn't really an ideology. Right. And he seemed to me like, he reminded me in your portrait a little bit of Surkov, uh, who was the kind of Karl Rove of the Putin, early Putin administration who loved Tupac and Obama as, as stylistic choices, but came from that, a uh, generation that was born in the early 60s that were so absolutely cynical and they just saw as this, the state as something to be milked and like you pay lip service to whatever ideology you want but you get what you get yours right so what compromise was Ernst making I, I think his compromise as you say it's not necessarily political or moral there I don't think he's in any sort of conflict with himself it really is a stylistic or aesthetic compromise is especially after the annexation of Crimea and the outbreak of war uh, in the Donbass and all that's followed as Russia's politics have really curdled into something quite aggressive and inward looking and suspicious of the outside world suspicious of cosmopolitanism suspicious of a lot of the values that Ernst once, and I think somewhere deep down still holds dear, his channel has been forced to adopt certain aesthetic or stylistic tropes that I know he must find distasteful. It's, you, you can't actually be a loyal foot soldier in the Kremlin's propaganda war and maintain these high aesthetic, uh, high intellectual standards uh, on the channel. I will say he's kept Channel One a little bit less covered in mud than the other two state channels. And that's interesting to see that nonetheless, there is something about his stewardship of the channel that makes it a little less uh, gross and uh, sulfurous than the programming on some of the other channels. But there's still a full-fledged beat-your-chest participant in the Kremlin's information war. And he knows he had no choice. You know, when duty calls... um, that's what the times required. But I suspect that deep down he'd rather be spending his nights picking which indie art house film does he want to buy the rights to, to air on primetime and channel one rather than having to defend egregiously fake segments that end up on his network. Like the story of this crucified boy in Eastern Ukraine that turned out to be uh, a completely invented uh, fake news scandal for him that he had to then spend some weeks and months and again with me explaining and defending. And I know that's not the position he'd like to be in. And good on you for pressing him on that. Um, since we're on Ernst, two more questions on him. One, um, you, when you wrote about Sochi and the, the, that incredible, incredible elaborate display of Russian history and culture he put on, you didn't mention that one of the rings didn't open, which became a kind of meme and a trope for everything that's wrong with the government. Do you, how do you explain that I, choice? Yeah, uh, that's a function of no great editorial, um, uh, I don't know, p- purposeful um, decision on, on my part. And, and if anything, if I would include it, this malfunction of the ring during the opening ceremonies, which was otherwise this really um, incredible uh, spectacle that was welcomed by all manner of Russian society, including opposition figures. Alexei Navalny was a big fan of the opening ceremonies. He's quite a nationalist, too. So. Fair enough. Uh, but when the ring didn't open and this was seen as the one embarrassing snafu in an otherwise uh, glorious and successful production, Ernst himself made fun of it. And in the closing ceremony, uh, he had one of the rings for a second also not open, a kind of wink at the audience uh, or not flash. And then it did. So that actually struck me as an interesting case of Ernst having a very rare 
for that degree of Russian uh, power and Russian officialdom, that sort of self deprecation, that kind of self irony, those are not features you normally see with people who occupy those positions of power in Russia. That's a great detail and anecdote. And it's also, you mentioned this a lot in the book that it's also part of like, part of how the state maintains its image and its, um, and its, uh, petita of legitimacy, right? Is it has people like you on TV, and it has you know these winks and nods that are at their mistakes, which is like we're not totally dumb. Look, we have some press. We have we're nice to foreigners, um, which leads me to ask why why did you go on Pierre Canal when a lot of our friends I think would say like don't legitimize them, don't even go near it. What was that choice like for you? And and describe that experience. Sure. The choice was pretty easy. I mean, I would welcome or accept uh, criticism of, of um, the moral defensibility of, uh, of that choice. But I just wanted to see what the factory floor of the sausage factory looked like. I mean, I'm, here I was for in studying Ernst, watching so much of Channel One, contemporaneously going back and watching old clips, watching the very show, Vremi uh, Pakaja means time will tell. It's a kind of Jerry Springer about politics, I guess the best way to say it, a sort of crass shout fest sort of show, but about Syria. Um, uh, however weird that sounds as a concept. Um, Does Syria get pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> There's a paternity test mid um, commercial break. Um, and so when they invited me on the show, and they're constantly, as you alluded to, inviting any living, breathing American within a 100-mile radius of Moscow, because there just aren't that many Americans who speak Russian who are willing to be beat like a birthday party pinata you know, by every guest who wants to step up and, and have a whack over the course of the hour. Uh, but I was, uh, f- for repertorial purposes, I guess you, you could say, um, because I wanted to know what it was like on set. I wanted to know what the hosts were like, what the producers were like, and just what it felt like to be at the center um, of that sort of uh, spectacle. And it was, as I expected, um, you know, my function there was to be the ready-made or kind of stand-in villain on whatever the topic du jour was, and this kind of avatar for America. I was always reduced to Josh the American, the, the notion that my own views, my own politics, the politics of the New Yorker might actually, on certain questions, be in total opposition to the reigning official American position. What even is the official American position, right? That, that like, also is sort of lost because of the continuity of power at this point in Russia over 20 years. I think this notion that, like, actually there can just be this total U-turns in official policy, right? There's a, a, Contradictions or, within one administration, right. as we see now. Right. Uh, so, but I was there just to be the stand-in avatar for America when whatever the topic was and however America needed to be used as uh, the boogeyman. Uh, I didn't expect much uh, else, and uh, I treated it like both a productive repertorial exercise and something comical that would later be a good story uh, with you and everyone here. So in that sense, it served its uh, purpose. What was interesting is that one night I went to go see one of the hosts of this show, uh, a guy named Artyom Shainin, who was a former Soviet paratrooper. He served in Afghanistan and this real kind of no-nonsense tough guy uh, who was the most kind of crass and over the top. And, and he once tried to punch another American uh, in the middle of the show, not me, but he kind of likes to throw elbows and really mix it up uh, on the show. And uh, I went to see him one night to have a conversation, just one-on-one, no cameras. It wasn't for the TV or anything. And he was really thoughtful and calm. We disagreed on substance on just about everything, but you know, he wasn't, he didn't try and choke me. Uh, there were no antics. Uh, he didn't interrupt me. And we sat and talked for, for three hours. And at the end of it, I told him, you know, Archiom, I have to admit, I'm a bit surprised by the tenor of this conversation. Like, well, this was kind of nice. Um, you know, normally when I'm on the show, you're interrupting me, you're shouting at me, you're calling me names. And here we just sat and had a nice talk. And he said, something like, it's in, it's in the chapter, I forget the exact wording, but something like, uh, uh, people don't go up to boxers on the street and ask them why they're not punching them in the face. When I'm in the ring, I'm doing one thing, and when I'm uh, out walking around the street, I'm doing another. And in that, I don't know how, is that any different than 
hosts on Fox News or MSNBC. I don't know. It's a job and you have to play inhabit the character. But I think there was a heightened degree of both showmanship and cynicism uh, in, in that statement to me. It's fascinating. Um, and while we have you, and can we go a little bit more behind the scenes? Like, how did you decide which characters were going to be in the book? Who was left on the cutting room floor? I think people love to hear about kind of the process sure. and the decisions that were made. I did think of it a bit in the beginning, kind of like a casting call, who were going to be my characters and how would I populate the book and who did I want to follow? And I thought about it for in a few different uh, through a few different lenses at once, or if you had a few different criteria in mind. One is I wanted a representative, or as representatives you can be, cross sample of, of people whose experiences or professions, lives, got at a lot of different aspects of Russia that I thought were important or interesting. So I knew I wanted someone from media, couldn't get any better actually than Ernst, the head of Channel One. Uh, so that was a pretty easy box to check once it seemed like he was in. I knew I wanted uh, a priest, someone to represent the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, that actually was one of the harder, or just took the longest amount of time for me to find the quote right priest. That's a world I know relatively less about if just by the nature of my job and living in Moscow, I ended up knowing a lot of people in media, even in state media, and just knowing how that world worked and who the major players were. I didn't really know much about the Orthodox Church and had to rely in the beginning on the advice of Russian journalist friends, people who were themselves regular churchgoers or just familiar with the church world and knew kind of who is who in that world and who the interesting characters were in that world. Because again, the, the initial criteria for anybody was they had to have experienced in some way or, or could reflect on this question of compromise. So I was already narrowing from the very beginning my, my prism uh, pretty severely. And, and down the line, I knew I wanted someone from Crimea. I knew I wanted someone uh, from Chechnya. I knew I wanted someone uh, who could reflect on the question of historical memory. I ended up, for that, focusing not so much on one individual, but an institution, a museum called Perm 36, uh, outside the city of Perm, that is a one of really the only museum to political repression in the gulag in, in all of Russia that's had it. Right. It's the only, it's the only museum or memorial complex on the actual site of a former prison camp in all of Russia. There's no other Auschwitz or Dachau style memorial complex slash museum uh, on the actual site in, in all of Russia. It's the only one. Um, and so I, I wanted to capture that wide range of Russian life and also geographically. I wanted there to be as little Moscow as possible. Moscow ends up being inevitable because Russia really is such a centralized place. That is an inescapable fact of Russian life. So a lot of what's happening ends up happening in Moscow, but I wanted to resist the temptation to you know, have all my characters live and um, work uh, in, in Moscow. And the last important criteria for me was one I alluded to uh, at the beginning, which is I wanted to find people whose compromises were in somehow confounding to me that, that I couldn't solve them or answer them. And I didn't know where, uh, as I said, where I landed on the moral permissibility of their compromise. I wanted to emerge from my time with them, still not able to cast a uh, conclusive judgment on them. And, and it really did end up uh, at that place. There's no character in the book who I would say is, you know, all the way good or all the way bad. There are some who I'm more sympathetic to the humanitarian and, uh, aid worker, Dr. Lisa, someone who my heart really goes out to, I guess you could say I never met her. Unfortunately, she died tragically in a plane crash in 2016 before I really began the active phase of reporting, um, for this book. And just like, as you said, Ernst is someone who, you know, he's, he's a big boy. He knows what he's doing. Maybe he knows better. And so I don't, feel that same kind of protectiveness necessarily about him and, and he can answer for whatever people want to you know hold him to account for, whether it's the crucified boy story or the fake news about MH17 that was on Channel One. So on that, I think it's, as I said, it's he's maybe engaged in less of a compromise and he also is just an experienced player who knows what he's doing. So there, there was a, a wide range of my own attitude, my own attitude to the characters, but I never could say, you know, this person is in the good category, this person's in the bad category. Anyone interesting left on the cutting room floor that you want to tell us about? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
Not really, um, because I at least, thank God, I had the wherewithal or efficiency to drop people early, right? there, I didn't like get months into reporting with someone only to realize they weren't the right one. The, the priest character took a while to come together. There were some false starts there. and But that all, actually, as you know, there's really no such this thing as wasted reporting, even though I spent a lot of time with some other priests who didn't make it into the book because I was so ignorant of that world in particular. It was just a great education in what the Russian Orthodoxy scene is like and how priests think about the patriarch and what life is even like as a priest. I mean, I needed a lot of education on that uh, subject. So there were some priests who didn't make it into the book, but I'm sure their experiences and stories they shared did somehow reflect my ability to act as a faux omniscient narrator uh, of that world. And uh, last question before we go to the audience. Um, You end your book very uh, presciently and I think uh, appropriately on younger people. And the other group that we in the West fetishize is young people all over the world and here, right? Like the grownups create the problems, but the high schoolers from Parkland, Florida are going to solve the gun issue and Greta Thunberg is going to solve climate change and college students in Russia are going to get rid of Putin for us. Um, What was your takeaway about like, what would you tell Americans about young people in Russia? Are they our great hope for a democratic Russia or getting rid of Putin, or are they just like their parents? I, I don't know, uh, despite having spent a lot of time with, um, with Russian young people and, and, and trying to figure out that exact question. Um, a little bit of both. I'll try to give them a less weaselly answer than, than that. Um, Wiley. We- <laughs> Uh, there definitely is something going on that's different with this generation than their parents. That, that seems very clear to me from spending time with them. And that has to do for just reasons of objective history, the formative experience for so many people or everybody really in Putin's generation was the decline of the Soviet Union. I actually think the period before the collapse, which was dominated by this wily doublethink that was the sort of lingua franca of Soviet society by the end that really produced a generation or two of cynics. And I'm not sure Russia has been able to overcome that in the years since. Those people now occupy the top positions of power. Will soon not, though. And they'll be replaced eventually by people whose formative experiences just came after. And there's no great magic or alchemy involved. It's just the fact that this generation wasn't steeped in that time, didn't have those experiences, and emerged with less cynicism and more trust. And I see the way that Russian young people engage in kind of social activities that require higher degrees of trust, higher bonds between what? individuals. Not even necessarily activism, I wouldn't say, just the way that they seem to trust one another to do the right thing ultimately, right? And I don't necessarily think their parents see the world that way, right? I don't think the parents navigate their lives presuming that this person will probably do me right in the end. I think, as you know from your experience, if you agree, a lot of Russians who are, say, 50 plus, 60 plus would navigate the world with exactly the opposite expectation. And in aggregate, I think that really does change a society if you have 120, 40 million people thinking that way. And soon you won't. Soon you'll have people who were steeped in a different culture. The question is, how strong will the inertia of the system be? Eventually, those young people with their ambitions, with their aims for their life, their dreams, will want to realize those dreams. And if the or compromise on those dreams. Well, right. But if the system, if the architecture hasn't changed so much, then it will require compromises that look quite similar to the compromises of their parents. And how will they emerge from that experience? Will they agree to the same sorts of compromises that their parents did? And will they be changed by those compromises? And will they emerge at the end of that resembling their parents more than they do now? I don't know. That's where my quasi weaselly answer comes in because we sort of have to run that game uh, to see its outcome. Okay, we're going to go to audience questions. There's a mic right there. Um, I'm going to be a tough moderator because Josh is so interesting. We want to hear more from him. 
Please say your name, make your question very short, and please make it a question, not a statement. And if you don't, I'll cut you off. <laughs> because Josh is so My name is David Falk, and this is a question about somebody you might have left on the cutting room floor. His name is Ruslan Telkov, and you wrote about him in 2013, a very frustrated entrepreneur who was impressed by his competitors who used the system against him. Whatever happened to him and why didn't you write about him? A real blast from the past. Thanks for mentioning that that story. Um, I kept up with Ruslan uh, for a little bit and he actually became a kind of entrepreneur rights activist and he was helping other entrepreneurs who ended up in similar situations who faced police uh, or criminal repressions uh, launched either by corrupt law enforcement officials or by their competitors in cahoots with corrupt law enforcement officials, as was um, in his case. And like I said, he and I kept in touch for a little bit. He was giving advice and counsel to other um, entrepreneurs. And I have no real good answer as to why I didn't include him other than that the book is already 380 something pages long. At a certain point, <laughs> I couldn't get everybody in, but I, I uh, take your point. And I, I always thought that Ruslan was a great um, character. And um, certainly the act of running a business in Russia requires no small amount of compromise, uh, no matter how clean you want to be or really are still, it's inescapable when the tax or veterinary police or whomever show up. Um, I do write about that bit in the form of a character in Crimea who's a zookeeper. Part of his experience is about the Crimean annexation, but part of it is also about running a business, his zoo in post annexation Crimea. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Sir? Uh, uh, my name is Rick Davis, and what I wanted to ask you is, how did everything you write about these people making compromises in their lives, how did that affect the dealings of Russia with the outside world? Is, or is, are they two different, or is it just two, two completely different animals? No, not necessarily, because like any place, but in Russia especially, or in, or in ways particular to Russia, domestic politics and foreign politics are really overlapped, or, or one grows out of the other and is certainly affected by the other. So in the case of someone like Ernst, as Russia adopted this much more aggressive stance especially in relation to the West and America most of all. After 2014, Ernst, as the head of Channel One, was absolutely swept up uh, in that. In fact, it changed the whole tenor of his channel, and it completely changed the nature of the compromises required of him, as I talked about um, a minute ago. Someone like Dr. Lisa, frankly, her death on board a Russian military aircraft flying from Sochi to Syria was directly linked both to her cooperation with the state or her willingness to participate in state-led humanitarian missions, but also with the Russian intervention in Syria. She was on a mission that was meant to be a kind of good PR mission uh, led by the Russian defense ministry to travel to Syria and deliver medicines to hospitals and that sort of thing. But her death was a direct outcome of Russian foreign policy, you could say, uh, to a certain sense. And even in the case of Perm 36, the museum dedicated to political repressions and the gulag, it was subject to what you could fairly call a hostile takeover from the state in 2015. It was founded in the 90s by some local DIY historians and eventually taken out from under them uh, 10 years later or more uh, by the state at a time at the, at the peak of the anti-Western, anti-Ukraine hysteria when, among other things, among other quote-unquote sins that the museum had committed, it was too soft on Ukrainian nationalist prisoners who were held at the museum, uh, in, or I'm sorry, who were held at the prison uh, in the post-war years. And in the new era, when anything linked to Ukrainian nationalism was equated with fascism, and that was used as an explanation for why Russia had to intervene uh, in Donbass, or at least stand up for the citizens of Donbass and was embroiled in this whole conflict. It was to prevent the return of this ugly Ukrainian fascism. Well, the museum couldn't have these exhibits that spoke too kindly of those historical figures. So even in places where you wouldn't expect it, Russia's relations and attitude toward the outside world absolutely affected the compromises required of my characters. Hi, Caroline, thank you so much. Um, my question is, we can expect that Putin may read this book. Um, what 
is the motivation for someone like Ernst to be like fully open with you, knowing and knowing that, you know, Putin might read this book. And um, do you think that there's any like underlying like plays out like there with how open he was or what he said? Is there anything that, you know, your experience with that under like that kind of um, big brother kind of watching you, right. watching these people and sharing that those stories, does that change the narrative? You know, I can't really ever know or fully penetrate why someone chose to, spoke, to speak with me and be open with me. And that does affect, of course, what they're telling me or how I process what they're telling me, why they're telling me. But it's ultimately unknowable <clears throat> to a final degree. Um, and someone like Ernst, I think that he really felt a need or at least a sense of r relief uh, in having this earnest, curious, fundamentally, I guess, sympathetic American journalist sit and listen to him and take him seriously, take his career seriously, and give him that credibility as an auteur, maybe an auteur who collaborated with a state that we all in America are going to say is evil and Putin's horrible. Fine. He, I don't think there's any under illusion is, has no illusions about that, but I will grant him the status of this cultural and artistic talent and, and visionary maybe even. And that the fact that I would see him in that light and through giving voice to his compromises also allow him to come off as more than just a uh, banal propagandist without any brains. I think that was important to him, important to his self-image, and there was something satisfying in having that read back to him by an American journalist. And I think that's true for his particular case, but something like that was going on for a lot of the characters. They wanted to be taken seriously and understood. The human rights worker in Chechnya who effectively change sides, I guess you could say, and became a kind of court human rights activist for the Kadyrov uh, regime, I think was motivated by a similar dynamic. A lot of her old colleagues in the Russian human rights community had turned their backs on her and really criticized her for that move, understandably, and she was left without a lot of former colleagues and friends. And I was there willing to listen to her story and hear her out and take her seriously. And I think a lot of the characters found something appealing in that. So can I just piggyback really quick, really quickly on that question? Um, did you find people, I'd be, it was interesting that people who spoke to you were quite aware of what they were doing, but there are also, as we know, people in the system who at a certain point drink the Kool-Aid a little too much and stop even being aware of the fact that they make compromises, right? And they just re really come to really believe this thing, like somebody like Simanyan, speaking of a fellow media figure, did you notice any of that where you just, you saw the person kind of, like they crossed a certain line and then the line disappeared so far beyond the um, rear view mirror that they've just lost all that perspective? Sure. Some of the people who weren't necessarily characters in the book who I didn't choose for exactly that reason because that was just a slightly less interesting or not the kind of compromise I wanted to pursue. But of course they come in as supporting characters and the uh, there's another Russian television personality, Dmitry Kisilyov, who in the 90s was a real avowed liberal, loved Western journalistic standards, and is now the most uh, egregious and, and kind of disgusting um, television host on Russian state media. He's like a Russian Hannity. Yeah, but, but even, I think, more, if possible, clownish and foul. Um, uh, and I think he's exactly that kind of person, right? He's so inhabited his new role that I don't think he reflects back on his old one and has any real capacity or interest in understanding how he got from point A to B, let alone bearing his soul in some way to a journalist who wants him to explain uh, that, uh, that journey. But even with someone like Ernst, there were moments where we were talking past, uh, each other. Absolutely. One of them was about <coughs> MH17, the shoot down of this, uh, Malaysian airlines plane flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur in 2014. There's been a lot of investigation, independent ones also by the Dutch government or by an independent commission led by the Dutch that proved pretty conclusively that it was shot down by a Russian made anti-aircraft uh, system that was provided 
uh, covertly to Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine at the time. And Channel One has put forward all sorts of absurd and contradictory theories about what actually happened uh, with MH17. None of them, of course, being that it was shot down by a Russian missile. Uh, the Ukrainians were trying to shoot down Putin's presidential plane. I mean, all sorts of contradictory theories um, that don't even match up uh, with one another. The point is just to produce a lot of noise and, and make people not believe in any one thing or another. But when Ernst and I were talking about MH17, it was clear we, we weren't actually talking about an objective factual universe. In the book I write about, it felt like we were having a conversation about aesthetics or, or religion, like we were two uh, intelligent minds almost taking pleasure from this kind of intellectual sparring match, talking about big ideas or our favorite films or whatever, rather than an actual uh, objective historical fact one specific thing did happen to MH17 and all other things didn't happen to it by definition, right? It was hard to have that like kind of... 300 lives were lost. Right. And it was hard to have that kind of conversation with him. And in moments like that, I did feel like, okay, whatever, you know, however we could have these shared kind of cultural references and have shared kind of cultural tastes, actually there is something um, that keeps us from having a, a true common um, uh, conversation. It's fascinating. Sir? Julia, Josh, Okay, right. sir. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks very much. I, um, your comments about Russian youth uh, was really what spawned this question, and it was going to be uh, have something along the lines of uh, exchange programs and what uh, who learns more and what do, what what happens in exchange exchanges between American youth and Russia. But I, don't, I want to change the question to another hypothetical. What would, what would happen, hypothetically, if you could put together a bunch of um, Russian journalists with a bunch of American journalists in some place where it wasn't bugged so they could be uh, spend a week in total uh, secrecy and so forth. That, that, that happens all the time in Moscow, in fact. Um, <laughs> in rooms that are bugged or not, I don't know, but that um, that is daily daily business in in, mm. in Moscow. Some of my uh, closest friends and uh, so, Julius too are, are Russian journalists. So who comes away changed? How are they changed? Who's who's changed more? What if from the experience? Yeah, I'm not sure either side. And here, I'd be curious to know what Julia says. Emerges particularly changed. I think I've certainly emerged with a respect uh, for the work that Russian journalists do and an acknowledgement actually that our attitude toward um, Russian journalism as this profession under siege, which it is, but it can veer toward a kind of patronizing um, affect by not actually giving credit to the real work that's being done every day. Right. There are journalists uh, being attacked. There are journalists uh, being murdered, but they're also far more journalists doing really brave, incredible, impactful work. And by painting all of Russian journalism with a broad brush and just saying, so oh, this, pity these poor people who are you know, perpetually you know, dodging uh, bullets from the Kremlin, I don't want to deny that reality, but it also denies the work that is being done. Right, so that's what, say, the, no, that's I, what the American journalists question. would... So uh, the, um, the other thing I would add to what Josh said is... Um, that we tend to, I think a lot of journalists go there thinking that these guys are kind of remedial journalists. They live under, under an authoritarian regime. They don't really know how to actually report or do journalism. And in fact, a lot of these guys put on a master class every single day and you think, holy shit, how, did, how are they able to get this or that scoop and the analysis they provide is can, can be super rigorous. And I also think that Americans over, overly fetishize people like us, and by asking us, you know, aren't you scared to go to Russia? Aren't you afraid that you'll be killed or beaten up? Fact is, we're quite privileged by uh, being maybe less untouchable under Trump, but quite untouchable as American citizens, and it's our Russian friends and colleagues who are under a daily threat, not just of being beaten up and killed, but more likely to just be driven out of the profession by the economics of it, which is far less sexy, which we don't really care about here when we hear about this or that independent journal or um, w news website getting shut down because advertisers are being pressured not to advertise and therefore people can't be paid, but and people have families and mortgages, et cetera, that uh, we don't really give those people martyr status the way we do to the ones who are killed. Um, so 
That's a terrible note to end on. Do you want to say one more thing so we can end on a happier note? Uh, no, only that um, uh, to echo what you just said. I've, I've been, I've certainly learned a lot in this book really couldn't have happened actually without the work of Russian journalists who were very generous in pointing the way to sources uh, and uh, ideas. So I would be happy to end on a note with um, thanks to them and their work. And you should all uh, read it to the extent you can. Cheers to them. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Josh. Thank you all.